so cool to see all the the places all corners of the world that we're um yeah meeting in this zoom together that is yeah really cool to see keep on sending those into the chat um but i think we will get started now um so yeah it's fantastic to see you all um for this webinar which is on the ipcc's latest report that was released just on monday um the working group two's contribution to the ipcc's sixth assessment report the one focusing on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. Um, so I think, as we all know, the release of these reports can be quite overwhelming and, yeah, quite intense. So that's why we put together this webinar and invited some incredible people um, to discuss the key messages and takeaways from the report and get some different perspectives um, on, yeah, how people are feeling with the release of this new, quite overwhelming report. Um, First up, we're going to have Vofam Karma and Hajit Singh, who are going to together unpack the main scientific findings from the report and go into a bit of what this means for climate justice and climate justice movements. Um, and um, yeah, so these two are really incredible experts. Um, Hajit Singh is a global expert on the issues of climate impacts, mitigation, adaptation. Um, and he supported countries right across the world tackling climate change and coordinating emergency climate responses and disasters, uh, disaster resilience programs. And so he's currently the senior advisor at Climate Action Network International and is serving as global director for engagement and partnerships at Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative. And joining him in the first section will be Professor Wolfgang Karma, who is an environmental geographer and global ecologist. And he's been working at universities in Sweden, Norway, and Germany, and is now a CNRS senior scientist at the Mediterranean Institute for Biodiversity and Ecology in France. And since 1992, he's been a contributor on the IPCC um, and is currently working as the lead author on the six assessment report. So two incredible voices and perspectives um, that we have the privilege to hear today. Um, and following those, we're going to hear from Svetlana Romanko, and who, who's going to talk about the critical links between fossil fuels and war and conflict, something that's extremely topical at the moment, given the current situation in Ukraine right now, um, but also the numerous fossil fuel funded conflicts that are taking, in other part, place, taking place in other parts of the world globally um, right at, that moment, at the moment. Um, and then finally, we're going to hear from three amazing climate justice activists to hear their perspectives on why, despite how overwhelming and intense this report is, why there's still reason to have hope and what people power means to them. So we're going to hear from Mitzi Jonel Tan, uh, who is a full time climate activist based in Manila in the Philippines, and she's an organization organizer with Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines and also for Fridays for Future in the Philippines and also on an international level. Kathy Yetnil Kilinya, who is a poet of Marshallese descent from the Marshall Islands, and she's the co-founder and currently director of the Marshallese youth non-profit Yo Yo Kim. And she also serves as climate envoy for the Marshall Islands government. And finally, Vanessa Nakate, who's an incredible climate justice activist from Uganda, where she started climate striking and she was the founder of Youth for future Africa and the Rise Up movements, as well as Green School Project, which is aiming to support Uganda's uh, schools to transition to renewable energy. And very excitingly, she recently published uh, a bigger picture, My Fight to Bring a New African Voice to the Climate Crisis, her incredible new book. Um, and also a reminder that at the end, we're going to have some time for Q and A's. So if you send in all your questions, then we'll have the opportunity to ask all of our panelists those at the end. Um, yeah, so don't forget to be thinking of really good questions and send them into the chat. So um, I guess I will pass on to Hayit and Wolfgang right now um, for yeah, their contribution. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Patsy, and thank you for the whole group to have invited me. Um, to, it's an, I see that as an honor to to be able to speak to you around the world and and uh, and explain a little bit what we've done the last last five years. Um, let me mention first that, of course, everyone who's involved in in the IPC is also 
really struck by the by the situation of war that has uh, has uh, come upon us uh, this last week. We've had the Ukra Ukrainian, dis despite having the um, the approval process uh, taking place virtually, we had uh, we have seen the Ukrainian delegation flee from their homes to, while while we were discussing with them. They, they were able to come back later online. Uh, but it was it was quite a shocking uh, period for us, and and we see of course the, the 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 reactions of the climate activist movement, which we which uh, I think is uh, seems to be very appropriate and balanced to see not only the relation between between these things, but also to first of all focus on solidarity with the Ukrainian people at this stage. So I uh, thank you thank you very much for this for this take that everybody uh, seems to seems to uh, share. Um, but if I come back to the science, um, let me also say that I'm I'm one out of about 300 people who have been uh, most deeply involved with this process, and there are 3,600 pages. So I uh, not only uh, can I not present all of that to you in 10 minutes, also I I honestly uh, don't know everything everything as well as uh, as I do you know some parts. Let me just quickly say what I have, what my role has been. My role has been to be part of the framing chapter where we explain some of the some of the concepts and principles. And I have also coordinated a chapter, a small chapter on the Mediterranean basin, which is um, from our perspective an in interesting region because it reflects many trends that we have also elsewhere in the world with, uh, with a strong disparity between poor countries and rich countries with a, a very rapid climate change with people with a direct uh, suffering from, uh, of people from climate change. And, uh, and so we, we've written the synthesis for that. And the last role that I've had was participate in the writing of the summary for policymakers, which is a not very easy piece to read, but, but I invite you to do it. It's only 30 pages in, in the current setting, and it tries to give uh, you the key messages. It's, it's organized around so what we call headline statements. And I'm going to come back to, to some of them quickly here now to, to, to basically give you an entry point. But um, before I even do that, um, I'd like to say that um, uh, basically, the summary is that it's it's of course uh, uh, a report that states many terrible things. It, ba it basically clarifies how uh, far away we are from a sustainable uh, development worldwide for all for, for all people, and how much is uh, how much climate change pro uh, created or caused entirely by human action is is making this this even more difficult. But it, it is also a report which is directly addressing you in a way, because it's, it, uh, if, you, if you look at, the, I, I don't have slides this morning, but if you look at the first slide, you will, you will see that the, the, the first picture in it is about climate action. It's about how, how to translate our knowledge. Uh, it's a conceptual one, but it's, it's how to translate our knowledge about the relationship between people and ecosystems under climate change towards action towards uh, and the action must of course always come come uh, in two parts there's one part which is to uh, improve our adaptive capacity to go in the direction of something that we call it's a little bit complicated uh, term but climate resilient development which means that the development that nevertheless takes place everywhere uh, around the world must be made cl climate resilient but it's, it particularly mentions a lot of options and opportunities don't ask for it to, to speak about emission reductions because that's another report which will come in about five weeks from now uh, from the from the third working group uh, so everything related to the energy sector and everything related to our urgent need and uh, currently completely unsatisfactory action of on the level of emission reductions is not the topic of this present report what this present report shows is that the, the uh, impacts of climate change are observable. They are not distant projections into the future. They are observable, or, uh, observable already now worldwide in all world regions. There's no region where there's no observed impacts anymore. Uh, many of these impacts affect humans, human lives and livelihoods directly, but also ecosystems. I, let me say in parentheses that this report is really also stressing the point that ecosystems have a value for themselves. Biodiversity has a value by itself. It's not just a commodity which we can consume, 
Um, and, and so if there's a damage occurring now or projected in the future on an ecosystem or on biodiversity, it is just as much a damage as it is if it affects us or our, our health. It's, a, it's, it's, um, it's an idea that has really been emerging over, over the last years and that is now strongly reflected, uh, reflected in the report. <clears throat> and it is very clear when it comes to adaptation that we have a lot of positive examples which we can point to a lot of options that we can explore, that we can strengthen, a lot of action that takes place. Um, but there are two, there's, there's two concerns. One, one concern is that there's not enough for, for a number of reasons, and finance being one of them, uh, the, 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 the funding um, that's required to, to assist uh, uh, both uh, low-income countries, but also um, uh, disfavored pop uh, populations in, in rich countries to, to, uh, to adequately adapt to, to, to the impacts of climate change. That's one concern. And the other concern is the, is, uh, are the hard limits that we are, we are unfortunately uh, approaching in some sectors. Uh, one that I always mention because it's easiest to understand is sea level rise. Um, there are large numbers of, of settlements and infrastructure and ecosystems along, along the world's coast. And we are currently, that has been shown by the report from last year, we are currently on track for a sea level rise that may actually reach a meter or so by the end of the century, but it could also be more. And that's, a, that's the worrying thing. And that's the thing that we really need to, to, to make people understand. We do not we are not in a position to predict whether it's two or, or, or three meters or something like that, but we cannot rule it out. And we are at the moment destabilizing the climate in a way that, that makes this risk um, uh, more likely. It's a low likelihood risk, but it makes it more likely to, to occur. Um, otherwise, you will see things um, that you all know, um, uh, uh, like, like the increase in extreme events uh, that we have all observed over, over recent years that is expected to continue, um, the, the uh, increasing uh, risks for, of water supply that larger numbers of people are, are in shortage of water, uh, agriculture being one of the um, most important consumers uh, of, of water, obviously. Um, the direct risk for human health. Uh, you basically find uh, specific details uh, on, on these matters as far as the scientific knowledge allows us to, pro to present them. One uh, perhaps last point at, at, at this stage that I would like to make is that the, the, the challenge, um, the request from governments for, for this particular report has been uh, to provide greater regional detail for all parts of the world. Our last report um, it was was criticized that that uh, some parts of the world, notably Africa, were very poorly covered with uh, with uh, information about risks and about about future projections. A lot has changed in with respect to that. Actually, not because the IPCC has become any better, but because there's much more scientific efforts in in all countries around the world to present and to to analyze and present. Uh, risks associated with climate change. So, uh, for it will never be satisfactory. But, but, but uh, the fact that there is so much more knowledge uh, at the regional scale is now pretty well reflected in this, in this report. Um, I don't know if that's uh, about the sort of uh, detail that that you would want at this stage. I'm here for the entire meeting, and I'm happy to answer any questions that that there might be, or or, or um, if there's a if Patsy or Ajit have some some concrete thing that you also still want me to elaborate. Perhaps the last point point I want to make is about this exchange with governments. Because that's, there have been questions from, notably from activists about that. Aren't we uh, sort of in a situation where we negotiate and we finally dilute our statements? Uh, the opposite is true. Um, we, uh, we have a process. We are, it's a UN organization. Uh, it's, it's an organization that is, is uh, driven by the participation of all countries of the world, not just by some, some polluting countries or something like that. And uh, based on this uh, structure, we present uh, government several times along the way with drafts. 
on which they can react. Uh, the last one being this, this approval process where, where an, uh, a finalized version of the summary is presented to governments and then uh, there's a long discussion. And that discussion, I can only tell you, is not a discussion to dilute things. It's a discussion to clarify things. And, and it has been, I think, very successful this time. Of course, there are always delegates who, who do not want to see something, but, when, but the principle is that the scientists hold the pen. And, uh, and that means that we, uh, that everything that's in the report now uh, are statements that are not negotiated, they're the statements of, of, of the scientific experts. That doesn't mean that there can't be errors or mistakes or oversights. Yeah, so don't don't, uh, don't forget that. But in 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 principle, um, this is a scientific report which has the great value that at the end it was, uh, in citation marks, approved by governments. Governments have taken notice of it. You, any one of you, can go back to your national government and tell them you cannot ignore this because you actually were there when it was presented and you said that you took notice of it. It's very, it's a, that's for me the most powerful message that actually comes out of the process. Thank you very much, Patsy and everyone for listening to me and happy to answer questions. Thanks so much. Yeah, and another reminder to add your questions. There's a, a, a Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom um, where you can send in all your questions um, and we'll make sure to get to those. Um, I, I'll pass on to Harjeet now. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Can you hear me properly? Excellent. Um, so I would also like to express my solidarity with my Ukrainian sisters and brothers who are facing the war and we are keeping you in our in our prayers. I uh, hope the um, situation uh, ends very soon. So I, I would like to uh, build on from uh, from what Wolfgang has um, presented. So I'll not, I'll not go uh, much into the science part, but I must underline uh, a couple of things that um, we, we must take note of. Uh, things that this report talks about. And I would also like to refer to the uh, speech from UNSG Antonio Guterres, who made, uh, who said some very powerful words at the launch of this report. We must recognize that this report is being launched in the context of 30 years of inaction. And most authoritative words on climate science have confirmed our fears, something that we are seeing all around us. And we have been saying for years now and also sending this warning to government. And this report, tells us very clearly we are late, we are really late. And when such an authoritative report tells us that nothing much has happened over the last few years, we must worry. And as, as Wolfgang was saying that this is a, a document which is for policymakers, not everything, not all the stark warnings that are presented in the technical summary you would find them featuring exactly the same way in, in the policy, in the summary for policymakers. And still the report talks about narrowing window of opportunity, which all governments now agree to, we must worry. And the report also says that half of the world's population is living on the edge. And how hundreds of millions of people are suffering already from extreme heat waves. Their food supplies are being disrupted. There are economic damages and natural systems collapsing. We are seeing displacement and forced migration. We are seeing huge impact on health, livelihoods, and life and, and well-being. Uh, urban areas are getting affected. So it, it, it is a very worrying situation. And then something that is much more alarming when the report says we are already reaching limits to adaptation. We have been fighting for a mechanism that helps people who are facing these impacts now. When we define climate action, we, we now talk about three pillars of climate action. Mitigation, which is emission reduction and protecting our forests and biodiversity. We also talk about adaptation, which means being prepared to deal with climate impacts. And that's what this report focuses on, but also talks about where we have failed, where 
millions of people are not prepared to deal with climate impacts and they are suffering loss and damage. And that's the language we use in the UNFCCC, UN Climate Space. And this report refers to those terms as losses and damages and limits to adaptation. There is some politics around it because countries who are not comfortable with the term loss and damage, because it does it does point to the inaction uh, that that they have that, that they have made in the last few years and how rich countries are responsible and liable to pay. They didn't want that that particular term to feature exactly in the same manner. Nevertheless, the term losses and damages and limits to adaptation points to a situation that we are late and we have not done enough on reducing emissions, uh, reducing the th future threat and also helping people prepare for climate impacts. And here we have millions who are already suffering and, and are losing their homes and, and income and are being forced uh, to, to, to migrate. This report also talks about equity, justice, climate justice, and even pointing towards colonialism that is responsible to make people vulnerable. How? And this is the first time the report points towards the historical injustices that we must definitely take, take note of. And it also talks about the lack of finance, how more money has gone towards mitigation, although still mitigation has not been enough, but very little money has gone for adaptation and we need to really ramp up. And we now cannot live in a situation where we only focus on mitigation we have to talk about adaptation. We have to talk about dealing with impacts in the same breath as we talk about mitigation. I'm not saying mitigation is less important. We have to work hard to stay below 1.5 degrees because already at 1.2 degree of temperature rise, we are seeing devastating impacts. We just cannot afford. It's a matter of survival for, for vulnerable communities, for indigenous people, for, for marginalized communities and 1.5, is, is means that a lot of communities are already going to be losing their homes and incomes and, and, and paying through their lives. Going beyond that is going to be absolutely devastating and unimaginable. So we have to still blow 1.5. Mitigation is important, but now adaptation has become equally important. And as I said, the report talks about the narrowing window of opportunity for climate resilient development. All the development actions that we are taking now have to integrate the climate aspect and, and make, make it resilient because it also points us towards the complex compound and cascading risks. This, there's a section on this, uh, on this aspect, which means that we have reached a point that's gonna become far more complex and we have to, we have to relook at our governance systems, our, our delivery mechanisms and across all the sectors. While it paints a disturbing picture of the future, it also provides a, a, a blueprint on how we need to act. So it, it has several, it provides us several options and examples where it has worked and where it has not worked. It also refers to maladaptation. So which means that this summary for policymakers is a very authoritative and a powerful document and message for policymakers to act. They don't have to look anywhere else. This, this is the blueprint that they have to uh, implement in, in countries. And lastly, I must also point towards the, the fights that we have been having in the, in the UN climate space. As I said, people are suffering. We now have three pillars. We have to make sure that justice is delivered in the UN climate space. We talk about global justice. And what does it mean? It means people who are losing their homes, they need to be supported. And polluters must, must pay for that, be it countries and corporations. And UN Secretary General very clearly targeted the fossil fuel industry. And we have, we have to do that. We have to bring it with front and center of our, of our climate fight. And they are the ones responsible. Uh, on one hand, we are fighting to even get $100 billion uh, from rich countries. And here, fossil fuel industry continues to enjoy the support in, to the tune of $11 million a minute. $11 million a minute. So it's not that there's lack of money. We need to, we need to divert those resources towards mitigation to help people prepare for climate impacts and the ones who are suffering. Because the, the bill is already rising. There are estimates that we will be uh, seeing damages to the tune of 290 to $580 billion a year by 2030. We need, we need money. We need to help countries who are dependent on fossil fuels to, to move away from it. We need money for just transition. We need a planned uh, transition and we need a framework to help, help those countries. So, 
all the three pillars of climate action have become important. And if we want climate justice, we cannot say we'll have to do one thing at the cost of the other. That's the message. And this report very authoritatively does that, brings the whole issue of climate impacts, which means adaptation and limits to adaptation at par with mitigation. And, and we have to make sure that when we talk about international cooperation and support, we are able to look at all these three pillars of climate action. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Haji, and um, also Wolfgang for yeah a really great overview of the key messages of the IPCC report and um, what we should be taking away. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And also both of you mentioned, um, of course, the situation in Ukraine um, and how we're seeing the realities of what fossil fuel funded war and conflict looks like. Um, so now we've got the opportunity to hear from Svetlana Romanko, who's going to yeah, speak about exactly the situation in um, Ukraine and um, yeah, war and conflict in fossil fuel uh, system. So, yeah, if you yeah, pass on to you now, Svetlana. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. And hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here. And uh, today I would like to express how we all feeling here in Ukraine being so much invaded, being in, at, at war. And these are times when our people, our communities are on the front line dying. And the most hardest thing probably to recognize is that this is a fossil fuel, fossil fuel financed war, which has been a uh, for long term, blindly tolerated with the range, the sequence of steps that brought all our system of exploration, extraction, burning, use of fossil fuels for many, many years. I would also say that this war confronts Europe, its energy system global energy system, many countries, which are seems to like doing nothing with uh, Russia territory by territory, but they are still importing oil, gas, and sometimes coal from Russia in such a way supporting the undemocratic regime and Equally understanding, equal understanding that fossil fuels are equal to the weapon of mass destruction. I think none of us is now doubting this equation. Uh, I have to say that the, in the past few days, we have witnessed unprecedented courage and bravery from Ukrainian warriors and civilians, and through the collective actions that countries of the world are taking to stop the war, and through the collective actions that the movement affected communities, uh, movement in different countries is taken, are taken to stop this war. There is some hope, and of course, we want peace and justice, but there won't be a peace in the world where Gazprom, Exxon, Total, Rosneft, many other corporations, you, you know all of them. And we actually prepare two lists of those, just not to forget who is on behind of the war of a massive, massive, massive destruction, not only infrastructure, but also democracy and human rights in the way it's a big threat to all the institutions we used to have on our protection for, for many, 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 many years. All, the, all these named institutions and many uh, fossil fuel corporations and many more financial institutions who are still funding uh, those activities, including banks, including Wall Street, big bosses, they all are allowed, allowed this process of extraction, transportation and burning fossil fuels. Besides concrete acts of solidarity alongside call for sanctions, pushing for a just transition, building a fossil free world is now the climate movement can outside of Ukraine contribute to building peace. 
So uh, just to update what we are all doing to restore justice and to establish peace, whatever we can as a climate movement, as an affected frontline communities who were put in the uh, place where they have to find the ways to protect themselves and to protect our joint fossil free future from, from this horrific war fueled by fossil fuels. So we are, as a Ukrainian climate community, we just were very united in a few calls to action, uh, which we would like to see implemented in the next months. Uh, these are, first of all, given that fossil fuels are equal to the weapon of mass destruction, uh, as I mentioned before, we call on fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, which can end new expansion of oil, gas, and coal production, and fair and equitable phase out existing production of fossil fuels, and just transition from fossil fuels to community-owned clean energy to end this horrific war and avoid future wars, which is very, very important. And second, we um, drafted a letter which we will be launching on Friday to all European nation states, the US, Canada, China, India, Japan, South Korea, and uh, all other importers of Russian oil and gas to divest, boycott and embargo all trade and assets of fossil fuels from Russia. And from the news, uh, we can see that some, some uh, rocks are being moved as for example, Canada, has banned uh, uh, import of fossil fuels from Russia and same action the US Congress is going to take today uh, and the process is ongoing. The big, big shift is underway, but we need to fasten it and uh, to get justice for, uh, for everyone, starting from Ukraine, but for everyone in this world. But however, it's imperative that the world not simply re replace Russian produced fossil fuels with fossil fuels from other countries, with an imagined priority of divestment and recording of all Russian oil and gas, fossil fuel expansion must be immediately halted and nations worldwide must commit to the rapid and just transition away from all fossil fuels. As a next step, we also will launch a petition to the Wall Street chief executive offices, which uh, where we would like to demand to turn their backs on Russian fossil fuel companies now because it may be too late in, a, in just in a few days. And I, I would like again to emphasize the importance of divestment, which we can um, get a very, uh, very quick proof of the justice can be restored. For example, 30% of Shell's profits were connected to, it, to its activities in Russia. And we see that Total is refusing to stop its activities there and has hardly committed not to invest in new projects. And we should, should, should remember that Total has not refused Eastern, uh, Eastern um, African crude oil pipeline. So the process is going not to be that easy, but we are very much determined to continue, uh, to continue uh, justice, uh, um, demanding justice for every affected community, of course, including Ukrainian emergency. And uh, also, I have to say that uh, people in Ukraine, like people on the front lines of the climate crisis, are demanding an end to the economic system that allows their lives to be thrown into the violent chaos. Uh, the sustainable option for peace and for climate is to accelerate the community-led transition to distributed and renewable energy for all that brings energy security and stability. To achieve that, we must dismantle these systems of oppression that allow corporations like Exxon, um, Gazprom, and all others to exploit reserves for, for the on acceptable purpose. The shocking war in Ukraine demonstrates how well dependence on Russian oil and gas is enabling dictators 
to use fossil fuel money to launch devastating wars and terrorize people. Our reliance on fossil fuel prevented governments and financial institutions from de-escalating the situation ahead of war and has helped fund the violence. Unfortunately, we need to recognize that and we need to cut our addiction to fossil fuels and not to be dependent on fossil fuel reserves anymore. The latest IPCC report has been uh, also discussed a lot and uh, I would like also to add that we should also review our net zero pledges for the, for, for, for the um, actually uh, affordability and for them, for them not to be in false climate solutions as IPCC report states that unproven technologies cannot guarantee the fossil free future for all. So we, are, we will need to look for new ways for providing the clean energy transition. But the better future is possible. And uh, I'm personally, as a lot of people in this world and a lot of communities in this world feel a deep appreciation of the solidarity we have seen, unprecedented solidarity and uh, unity we have seen all over the world to end with uh, not only with the war, but with so-called uh, oppressive world so far. And I believe we will be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Svetlana. I can imagine, yeah, it's a really, really tough situation for all of you. And I hope that you can feel the solidarity um, that's been shown globally. Um, and yeah, that you know that we're not gonna give up um, fighting for Ukraine and, yeah, this is really um, showing us exactly what fossil fuels can do and how they can fund conflicts. So, yeah, thank you so much for joining our panel. Really much appreciated. Um, so now we will hear from three amazing climate ju justice activists, Mitzi, Vanessa and Kathy. Um, to hear about their perspectives on the IPCC report and also hope and people power. So I will pass on to, I think, Mitzi first. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Mitzi from the Philippines, as Patsy already mentioned. And I don't know how you guys feel, but I am feeling so overwhelmed with the IPCC report. Technically, as a climate activist, nothing is really that new in the report, except for the you know, phenomenal um, mention of colonialism, which is a good milestone in the, in the right direction. But Technically, you know, the things that are in the report are things that we've been seeing already, especially in countries like mine in the Philippines, or they're things that we've kind of known already. But to see it once again, be reminded that, you know, worse impacts will happen. To see the numbers of just how bad it will get for us as leaders across the world continue to choose profit over people, it's scary. And there's this deep sense of betrayal that happens because I know how these numbers look in real life. To me and so many of us in the global south across the world, the report isn't just a bunch of words and numbers. There's a corresponding experience, memory, and fear that's attached to each of them. And there's a climate anxiety based on climate trauma that just threatens to eat you up. And it's so scary to know that the hell that we're already experiencing and we've experienced is just going to get even worse as political leaders everywhere continue to, again, choose the fossil fuel industry, choose their profit over people's lives every single day. And in times like this, it's almost like, is there a chance, is there hope, especially with what's happening in Ukraine, especially with what's happening across the world, where a friend of mine was also, who was an environmental defender, he was, an, he was a volunteer for two indigenous communities, um, and he was killed by the military. And there's just so much happening across the world. And it's almost like, you know, politicians are not listening to us. A lot of our activists are being killed. There's a war. People are dying everywhere, not just in Ukraine, but there's so much going on. How can we fix this? And then I go back to when I first became an activist. It was in 2017 when I was able to talk to an indigenous leader of our land. And he told me about all the horrible things that they were experiencing, the harassment, the displacement, the militarization, the murders. And 
So simply, he shrugged and chuckled and said, that's why we have no choice but to fight back. Then he laughed about it and made a joke and then kept going. And really, it's just that simple. There is so much injustice, and that is why we have no choice but to keep fighting. Because to give up hope, to give up is to let the fossil fuel industry and to let this profit-oriented system win. To give up and say there's nothing we can do anymore is to say that I don't believe in the power of the people. But that's not something that I can ever accept. I will always, always believe in the strength of the people because we've seen historically that empires have fallen in the past. Young people have stood side by side with marginalized sectors of society leading the way towards change. This is just the latest wave of revolution and it's so difficult and it's so slow, but that's how it is. That's how change works. It's difficult, it's not immediate, and it's something that is scary and painful, but it's something that we're going through together. And when I am at my lowest, I just go back to the that memory, that line, there is no choice but to fight back. And then I also remember that there is someone literally in every single country fighting for the same thing that we are. Like I'm friends with Patsy and she's across the world. I'm friends with Vanessa, I'm friends with so many people across the world. And he's, he's built this community of love and care and union. And if climate activists who are young can do this, can collaborate with women that are across the world, across time zones, across language, across barriers, across cultures, I'm sure one day our leaders will be able to do this too. We just have to keep showing them that it's possible. We just have to keep pressuring them and demanding them to get rid of this ego and prioritizing profit and choose people, choose community, choose union and collaborate with one another. And until that happens, we're going to keep fighting and we're going to keep demanding for reparations from the global north to the global south, for a just transition from the fossil fuel industry, for adaptation and for um, people-centered adaptation especially. And again, for our loss and damages to be recognized and to be provided for and to be managed. And honestly, like I, I won't lie to you guys and to myself that I'm at my most hopeful and most inspired moment in my life right now. But I always just go back to that reminder that we have no choice but to fight back. The world might be might seem like it's ending, but that's how it is during winter also. And I say that as someone who doesn't experience winter, but sometimes it's so cold and you don't see anything, but suddenly warmth starts to seep in. We just have to let it seep in. It might be scary and that's fine. That fear and that anger and that sadness is completely valid. And I get the temptation to just shut everything out and escape. And that's fine. You can escape for a little bit, but come back to us because we are here to hold you in grief, to hold you in protest, to hold you accountable. We're here to be with you. That's what the youth movement is to me, that despite all the difficulties, internally, externally, everything, we're always gonna be here for each other because we have no one else. We have no one else to hold on to but each other. We know that the world leaders, the global north um, politicians and the imperialists and the colonizers, they're not gonna be here for us. There's no one else to be here for us but us. So you have to come together and unite. You have to hold on to that hope and remember that we are so powerful. They want us to think that we're not. They want us to think that we're alone, that we're individuals that can't do anything. They want to separate us from each other, but we are not because our liberations and our struggles are tied to each other. And as long as we hold on to that, as long as we hold on to that love for the people, except for the 1%, and love for the humanity and life and joy, then we get stronger because we can't just be anti capitalists or anti-imperialists, we have to be pro-people. We can't just be anti-fossil fuel industry, we have to be pro-renewable energy. We can't just be anti-oppression, we have to be pro-love and pro-joy. And remember that there is a beautiful world that we're fighting for and a gentler future is promised to all of us and we will keep fighting to build that world where we can all just be gentle and be at peace and sing and dance and laugh. And that world exists and it will keep coming and we're already seeing pockets of it now to hold on to those memories when times like this. And we're gonna keep building the world until all systems of oppression and injustice are dismantled. And it's gonna be a long way, but we're gonna be able to do it together. Thank you. Wow. Um, yeah, nothing to add, just, yeah, really, really incredible. Thank you so much, Mitzi. Um, I'll pass on straight to Vanessa. 
Thank you so much, Patsy. Thank you so much, Mitzi, or is inspired. Hi, everyone. My name is Vanessa Nakate, and I am a climate justice activist from Uganda. And I'm happy to be on this call and to speak with all of you today. So it's evident that you know the climate crisis is already affecting so many people across the world. Climate change is already killing people, animals, plants in different parts of the world. And you know, we've seen it, we've seen this in communities that are already on the front lines, communities across you know, Africa, the most affected areas and peoples are already facing some of the worst impacts of the climate crisis. And just you know, um, this year we have seen different climate disasters unfold across the African continent, from the tropical storm Anna to Cyclone Batsurai that affected hundreds of people, you know, that led to the death of so many people, that led to the destruction of so many homes, schools, power lines, and leaving people with no access to electricity. So the climate crisis is, you know, affecting people's lives, is affecting people's livelihoods, people's, you know, chances and, you know, moments of education, because as schools are destroyed, you know, many children, they don't know when they'll go back to school, as power lines are destroyed, Many homes don't know when they will have access to electricity again. So the climate crisis is something that is affecting, you know, different aspects, different sectors of our lives. And we know that even at, you know, 1.2 degrees, many communities are already suffering some of the worst impacts of, you know, the climate crisis. And as we fight for 1.5 degrees Celsius, you know, it still won't be the safest for our communities, for communities that are already suffering the worst impacts of climate change. And to me, these are some of the, you know, the horrible realities of the climate crisis. So climate change continues to kill people. Climate change continues to destroy schools and hopes of education. Climate change continues to destroy hospitals, you know, and access to safe facilities. Climate change continues to destroy people's homes and people being left homeless. So we realize how all the challenges of food scarcity, all the challenges of water scarcity, gender inequalities, you know, conflicts in our societies, all these are, you know, attached and connected to what climate change is already doing in our communities. And it will only get worse as the temperatures continue to rise, as we've read and seen in the report that even with the current emission plans, um, the temperatures will continue to rise and affect so many people. And that's why there is a need you know, to act now. That's why there is a need to speed up in the right direction because there's been a lot of speeding up, but in the wrong direction. So there is a need to speed up in the right direction for the leaders to make decisions and policies that will ensure that the people and the planet are protected. And, you know, the question is, is everything in the report a surprise to all of us? Of course not. It's not a surprise, you know. This is something that people have been talking about for years. We've seen in the climate movement, activists have been talking about the impacts of the climate crisis for so many years. And this has been through the different uh, climate strikes, the different marches, the different grassroots movements in different countries. So we have been speaking about these things. We've been speaking about the climate crisis and how it's already happening now and how it's not something that is coming in the future. You know, we've been talking about how communities that are on the front lines of the climate crisis are not responsible for this crisis. We've been talking about how communities that are on the front lines of the climate crisis are not on the front pages of the world's newspapers. So for a long time, we've really been talking about the inequality of the climate crisis and how 
we may all be facing the same storm, but we are definitely in different boats. So this doesn't come as you know a surprise to us. It's more of something that we've been talking about. And we need it. And we need the leaders to understand this because maybe when we speak, they, they won't listen to us, but we believe that they can listen you know, to the science and, you know, what has been written down about what the climate crisis is doing to communities, what it's doing to people that are not responsible for it. So activists or generally movements have been talking about the impacts of the climate crisis and demanding for climate justice. And as this report has come out, I think that we just need, you know, to keep speaking up to keep fighting like Mitzi has said that injustices are all over the world you know they're in different parts of the world and we can't just stay silent as injustice escalates so we have to keep speaking and demanding for climate justice we have to believe in our own power as people that it's actually possible that another world is actually possible, that a clean, a healthy, a sustainable future is actually possible. So to me, this is the moment for us to just keep doing what we have been doing, to keep highlighting the inbox of the climate crisis, the inequalities of the climate crisis, you know, to keep highlighting the losses and damages that are already happening in different parts of the world, to keep highlighting the inequalities in climate solutions. So we can't just, you know, keep silent right now. We have to keep demanding for leaders to act quickly, for leaders to speed up in the right direction, for leaders to make decisions that prioritize the lives of the people and our planet and the ecosystems and the animals. Because in the end, it may seem like, you know, it's hopeless, you know, it may seem like it's not possible, but we have to believe it because that is where our strength lies. That is what keeps on moving. Because we always have to ask ourselves why we started activism in the first place. So it's more of looking at that vision and the kind of world that you imagined before you started activism and believing that you can actually achieve it. So we need to look at the why we started activism and why we need to continue because we haven't yet seen you know, what we have been demanding for. When everything seems hopeless, we believe anyway, even when there is no reason to hope, we keep believing. Hope is our strength that another world is not only necessary for all of us, but it's actually possible for all of us. So against hope, we believe in hope. We have to believe in hope, even when it seems like we are believing against hope. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Yeah, really, really wonderful to hear your perspective. And um, another reminder that if you want to ask questions, please ask in the Q&A um, button section so that they don't get lost in the chat. Um, and you'll have the opportunity to speak to all of the panelists yeah, in the Q&A section. Um, and I'll pass on to Kathy now. Uh, Yago Yale from the Marshall Islands. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Kathy Jadengal Kajinar, and um, I'm working with the Marshall Islands. And uh, we are, are very much have been looking forward to the IPCC report coming out. I mean, looking forward as much as you can look forward to some of the really dire uh, findings that we know are going to come with these kinds of reports. But for us, um, I think the topic of adaptation is, is really crucial and key for our islands. Um, you know, a few years back, we had scientists, a scientist named Dr. Chip Fletcher from Hawaii come to our islands and basically tell us that we no longer have the opportunity to keep focusing on mitigation, but that we needed to switch to adaptation because the world wasn't changing fast enough and our islands are too vulnerable. 
Um, so because the Marshall Islands is an atoll nation, we're only two meters above sea level. And as the findings have stated already, um, you know, uh, atolls and small island nation and small islands are particularly vulnerable. And that's why um, we're having to now uh, build what we're calling our national adaptation plan, which is our what we're calling our survival plan. Um, so before this, we had initially been really focused on trying to get the rest of the world to mitigate, to focus on emissions and lowering their emissions. But it was like we could no longer just focus on that anymore. We've become more internal and started to focus more on ourselves in protecting ourselves. I know that we're here to talk a lot about, um, you know, about how the world is getting impacted by adaptation and uh, the global implications of it. But I hope you don't mind me speaking specifically from the perspective of, of atoll nations. Um, you know, with the Marshall Islands being only two meters above sea level. You know, we're not like other island nations. We don't have volcanoes. Um, we don't have mountains. There's, you know, nowhere to go, basically. Um, it's, it's very thin, completely flat strip of, of land. And so we're incredibly vulnerable to uh, the rising sea level. Um, so we're looking at really extreme options to, be, to, to make sure that we can stay in our islands. We're looking at, you know, elevating our islands. We're looking at elevating pieces of land. We're looking at building completely new islands. You know, these are incredibly extreme solutions. And when you take into account the fact that the Marshallese, uh, our Marshallese culture is tied to land, it makes it even more complicated, you know, because every Marshallese owns land in our culture and we have an incredibly complicated land tenure system. So what happens when we change uh, a land, the landscape of our island? What happens to the land ownership? You know, what happens to um, the, the privileges that might come with that to our cultural ties. So we have been trying to beat the drum on adaptation for a minute now with um, a lot of these global leaders to say, look, you can't just focus on mitigation. You need to start focusing on adaptation. You need to increase financing for adaptation specifically. I mean, we got some costings of what we're looking down, uh, what we're looking at, you know, like down the line of for our these adaptation pathways that we're considering. And it's going to cost tens of billions of dollars, you know, and where are we going to get that money? Marshall Islands contributed like 0.00005% of the world's global emissions, something crazy like that. And yet we're the ones that have to pay for the, you know, these incredibly costly changes that we made no contribution towards that's it's it's irresponsible so i think that um you know for us i think the adaptation report is really timely and it's really important for getting um you know these world leaders to really consider that the shift in the focus needs to be going towards adaptation now more than ever um, and it, it 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 there's been this kind of battle and i think as uh harjeet had mentioned earlier it's gonna really come to the point where, and that's where loss and damage needs to come to the boat too. It sort of felt like mitigation and ad mitigation was like the focus and then adaptation is sort of coming up now and loss and damage. And it feels as though it's like in a, in a line and it, it needs to be all parallel, right? Because there's only a, a so point, there's no, you can only adapt so far before there's irreversible loss and damage. You know, that's where the limits are. And that's why things like the National Adaptation Plan, this plan that we're building out as a nation is so important to identifying what is going to be lost, you know, that what, what cultural heritage, you know, these intangible things, culture, these intangible costs, you know, how do you put a price tag to that? Those are questions we have to start answering for ourselves. And that's why that mechanism was so important too, that we were trying to fight for at the, at the COP. So, you know, I think, um, I think the that's what I think that's kind of what um, why I, I I have I'm actually really glad that the report came out despite how dire it is and as you all have mentioned before you know it, it wasn't saying anything com completely new to us but I am appreciative of it mentioning the legacy of colonialism you know Marshall Islands and so much of the Pacific has been colonized and so much of the rest of the world too and and that's a kind of a a uniting factor that that's that's rarely mentioned in the room. Um, and then, but I, as far as hope, you know, when I, when I consider hope, because I think a lot of times people look to us um, in small island states um, in the Pacific as a vanguard, you know, how do you keep your hope? Um, just two days ago, just yesterday, not two days ago, just yesterday, 
was uh, the, the commemoration of the, the detonation of the nuclear testing. Um, the US tested uh, 67 nuclear bombs on our islands, one of which was more powerful, a thousand times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. It's called the Bravo bomb. Yesterday was uh, the day that we come together as a community, as a nation, and um, remember and grieve those tests. Those tests are still not well known. Um, we still are waiting for compensation that is owed to us. So many of the elders who were there for those tests have died. I think what that tells me is that the fight for nuclear justice is similar to the fight against climate change in the sense that this is all a long game. You know, we have to stay in it and we have to know that this is not going to happen and will be resolved quickly, even though we need it to be resolved as quickly as possible. Um, so the hope, I get hope from, uh, when you say, where do you find hope? I get hope from the elders who fought before me. Um, I get hope from the young people who I work with, um, uh, the young people who I work with at Jyotigum, our organization. I get, I get hope from the youth activist movement and, our, um, and also the 350 Pacific Climate Warriors. I think I tend to be a bit regional. You know, I, I'm a big Pacific Island nerd <laughs> and um but i i think that there's a lot of hope in in connecting the way that we're connecting right now through conversations and hearing from one another um and continuing to fight because it's a long game you know we gotta we gotta dig our roots deep so the the theme for this year's nuclear justice day was going to go which is basically like rooted like the like a tree um, and that's exactly how we have to be. We have to be completely rooted in this fight to, to, to stay and, um, you know, to, to maintain our strength. So I think that's, um, I guess that's what I would offer for now is, uh, those kinds of reflection is, uh, those reflections on, on the importance of this report and the importance of, of recognizing the unique uh, vulnerability of atoll nations like, like ours in the Marshalls. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Yeah, hope is a really tricky thing, I think, always um, in yeah, within climate activism, but especially when we get the kind of confronting um, reports that come from the IPCC. Um, we will move to a Q&A now. Um, some really great questions have come into the chat. You can still add more questions um, to the panelists. And also a reminder that there have been some links sent into the chat um, about the fossil fuel treaty, the letter that Svetlana mentioned around Ukraine, and also Wolfgang put a thing in there about a link uh, to the special section of the IPCC report about small islands. Um, so definitely check out those links. Um, but moving to some questions, um, I think the first one was, um, Maybe you could hear from Hajit and also Kathy, um, both of you on this one, which is, could you talk a bit about maladaptation and how big is this um, as a problem in, for the global south, um, to the struggle to get appropriate grant-based adaptation finance, and how is maladaptation financed? Um, yeah, would be great. Maybe first Hajit and then Kathy. Sure. Um, let me talk about maladaptation a little bit. And um, so th this, con this concept has really evolved when we saw communities and governments uh, taking steps uh, to adapt. And uh, speaking to the concept, we need to look at what we do as measures of adaptation and how we do. Uh, and and I've, seen, I've seen myself where some of the adaptation options failing. Uh, I can take an example of Bangladesh where because of the increase in salinity, uh, fisher folks shifted to prawn cultivation and they started making money for the first few years and then the long-term impact of prawn cultivation is land goes really really bad and you can't do any other kind of farming on that land so you earn money for 10 years and then land is is just uh, you know gets degraded for years to come and and that i would define as as uh, maladaptation we also know that irrigation helps and it is seen as one of the adapt um, uh, adaptation options, but we cannot go for you know over exploitation of groundwater and start you know, uh, go going for sugarcane, uh, which is a high value crop, but we know how much water it consumes. 
so we need to we need to choose the options very closely you know there, there's a case study from cambodia uh, where the diverse natural forest was replaced with acacia plantation which which affected communities and also the ecosystems so there are uh, examples of sea walls where we are using hard defenses against flooding as opposed to mangroves and when you use these hard defenses or sea walls they have their own impact on ecosystem so how do we also allow ecosystems to recover on their own so we need to adopt practices which are uh, which are sustainable in the long term and then its impact on communities we can't just sit in the boardroom and develop adaptation options however good they are technically and which are going to marginalize communities how do we involve indigenous people and women and and young people so it's it's about what and also about how which means adaptation has to be in harmony with nature and we need to be consulting people in terms of finance this has been a major gap and it goes back to the same point that i said earlier the focus in, in the initial few years of climate action has been so much on mitigation that we completely undermined efforts to raise money and we have not questioned rich countries enough who are responsible to pay and as there was a question on uh, there is very little grant based money for for adaptation and even now when rich countries claim they have delivered 80 billion dollars you know by their own admission uh, when you go into details they say 71% is loans and guarantees now you you can't depend on loans and guarantees for adapt for adaptation it's a public good and you need grant based financing for adaptation um and right now developing countries are using their scarce resources and shifting money from education and health towards adaptation now that's absolutely unfair and the current level of financing is about 20 billion dollars a year and at cop 26 there was an agreement to double the finance by 2025 which means it's going to be only 40 billion dollars a year and unep came up with a report in 2016 saying we'll be needing about 300 billion dollars a year by 2030 and 500 billion dollars a year by by 2050 so that's the scale of money that's needed and and mind you these estimates came from came came in 2016 and every other ipcc report has painted such a grimmer picture and we will be needing a lot more money so there's a massive gap and again we need to hold rich countries to account uh, to for the commitment they made but they have not delivered really money on uh, adaptation Thanks so much Haji. Kathy, would you like to come in on that too maybe? Yeah, um I think I would just echo a lot of what Haji has actually mentioned. Um you know, we have cases here uh, where we we have to invest a lot in seawalls out here because there isn't anything else to to break the tides from coming over into our islands. But we've come across issues where they have this massive seawall project, but then because of COVID, they couldn't ship in any of the supplies that they needed to build the seawall. So then it became like stalled. and then it was like options of like blowing apart the reef and using that to build the seawalls but then that seems counterintuitive so it's just there's a lot of these kinds of issues that we're having to to figure out ourselves also because what people don't understand is in the marshall islands there's like 24 atolls and they're all different and they have different ecosystems and they have different needs and they have different vulnerabilities to the sea level so you know how do we how do we we'd have to figure out how to adapt to each of those and so that's kind of some of the issues that we've come across um there's also kind there's been also been a lot of debate about between like hard adaptation solutions versus nature based solutions you know we want to invest in nature based solutions because that's more in line with you know taking care of our island and um um and and using indigenous practices our our traditional practices to to protect ourselves but on the other side of it we have to be realistic about what kinds of uh sea level rise we're anticipating down the line and the and the huge you know what i mentioned earlier about those really big extreme adaptation solutions those are it, those are uh, uh, con, uh pathways that would take a lot of funding and a lot of financing and so i again just would just echo a lot of what haji just said about you know the lack of financing that's there um you know uh it's so strange to be in rooms with with world leaders who who refuse to double the finance to double the financing for adaptation um not recognizing how much of an issue it is and then um and then uh also looking at adaptation as a side conversation you know they'll say things like well let you know let's not focus on these side conversations let's focus on mitigation so you don't have to adapt not recognizing that we have no choice we're already there we need you guys to just come on board and start giving us the financing we need so we can implement it and i think a lot of the other issues also is 
sometimes this financing comes with strings attached. You know, um, it's really like difficult for our countries to access this financing, or they want to do it through their own consultancies. Um, when we have experts on island who who already have gone through and figured out actually mangroves don't work for us, you know, and and yet they want to they want to fund their own ideas. So there's a little bit of that too, where they're not investing in the right kind of capacity for us, or or not you know believing in our technical skills. So there's a bit of that also. So I, I think that's uh, all I would add, but I, I just agree, you know, we need to, I hope this IPCC report wakes up a lot of these world leaders to increase that financing for adaptation, because that's what we need right away. Yeah, that's a really huge topic. Um, and thank you for both of your contributions. I was wondering, Wolfgang, do you also have something that you'd like to add or anything? Um, yeah, from your perspective to add on to that question is, yeah, quite a, a, a big one. Yeah, well, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, well, I, th I think the, the, the trade-off or the, the, the debate between uh, mitigation and adaptation has, has always been around and it has always been wrong. You know, we, we've basically said from the onset that, that you can't adapt your way out of it and you can't really uh, just point uh, to, to mitigation as, as, as the only solution. So um, I, I think anyone uh, making um uh, well being an activist about this will find suitable examples and and information on on the on the uh, adaptation issues in the report i only i only want to to restress that and particularly in the regional detail uh, for it so so i hope it's being it's being a, a useful uh, support i've, I've linked uh, the small islands elements um, uh, in in the chat but they are also really easy to find and uh, there's also similar material for other parts of the world um, but um, uh, as far as for mitigation is concerned, that does remain, of course, equally important. It, it's just that we, we should perhaps have, a, uh, have another discussion, discussion about that six weeks from now when the, when the working of three part comes out, because that's going to say uh, a lot of new things, I hope, uh, in that regard. I'm not personally involved, but, but uh, there's an, there needs to be similar attention about that. That's all I can say at this point. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, now, a second question, I think, specifically to Svetlana and Vanessa, but then if anyone else wants to jump in, um, Mitzi, perhaps, um, any of you welcome to jump in as well. Um, so the question is, most, if not all, conflicts in Africa are because of minerals and notable the fossil fuels, especially when looking at the ongoing insurgency in Mozambique, Sudan, etc. And these wars are ongoing, funded by the same companies, and yet the world is quiet because it's not happening in Europe. In light of the failure of COP26 and wars, how can one hold these companies really accountable if courts and justice systems make it so difficult for the affected people to have even their fundamental rights respected? I can come in on that. I think that, um, we first or people need to first understand how you know many of these things are connected you know be it the you know minerals and wars or and conflicts in our societies i think the earlier people understand the interconnectedness of you know everything that pertains to our life and our survival i think the better it will be to speak about these things and advocate for these things. And I will just give an example. If we talk about, you know, climate change, climate change is, you know, more than, it's more than weather, it's more than statistics. And it's about the people and how people are being impacted. So when you think about how, you know, some of these conflicts in, uh, in certain nations are because of minerals like oil, you know, you know, things like gas or coal. These are things that contribute to the climate crisis. And that's why the climate movement has to be intersectional. The climate movement has to, you know, learn how to make the connection with these things to know that, you know, one issue can lead or it leads to the occurrence of another issue. Because as these corporations continue to 
you know, greed after oil or coal and gas in, for example, African nations, then more of these conflicts continue to happen. So we start to look at climate change beyond, you know, rising temperatures or degrees. We start to look at it at, you know, how it's impacting the people and how because of the corporations or the governments that are fueling the climate crisis. We are having conflicts in these areas. We are having wars in these areas for the resources. It can't even be through the some of these, you know, the climate solutions that are presented as solutions. Yet in the end, it's just, you know, greenwashing. You know, you see companies propose tree planting campaigns in certain regions, but then you realize that the end of this tree planting campaign means communities are going to lose their land for farming. You know, communities are going to lose their land for their own survival, for their own settlement. And this could cause conflicts. So I think we need to really communicate the interconnectedness of all these things, the interconnectedness of climate and poverty eradication climate change and achieving zero hunger, climate change and having peace in our communities, climate change and the wars for oil and the wars for gas in, you know, in certain uh, nations. So I think learning how all these things are interconnected and working to communicate that, that interconnectedness, I think it's one of the ways that we can move forward in addressing these issues. And for people to understand that we are all in one system, you know, we are all in one system, that if it's, you know, uh, if it's a puzzle, then all pieces need to be fitted together for the world to be at peace. All pieces need to be fitted together for the planet to stop you know, warming. All pieces need to be fitted together for people to be lifted and removed from poverty, for people to, uh, to stop starving because they have no access to food. All these pieces need to be fitted together. And that fitting of all these pieces starts from understanding that we are all one system. We are all one body. We are all one whole puzzle that needs to be put together. And we can only move successfully. We can only move forward. We can only move you know, to a future that is not only, you know, to a future that is not only, you know, that has, I'm thinking of a way to articulate it, sorry. So we can move to a future that is, not just about temperature reduction for the planet, but one that is about temperature reduction, one that is about achieving zero hunger, one that is about having peace in our communities, one that is about you know, people being able to access affordable energy, for people to understand the connectedness of all these things. I think it's the start and you know, the beginning of us addressing these issues. Thanks so much, Vanessa. Um, Svetlana, would you like to come in on that or add anything to what Vanessa has already said? Yes, I would just um, use this chance to add uh, some kind of interconnectance and uh, to um, stress of how everything is interconnected in our world. Justice to injustice and a prerequisite to a sequence. So uh, doing that, I would just uh, say that I don't think that anyone, neither a country uh, nor a fossil fuel company, as for example, Total or other companies, should increase fossil fuel exploration using the desperate need for energy, desperate, desperate thirst for energy that we see now in many countries. In opposite, uh, we, uh, these companies should not compensate the possible losses somewhere of course, we need we need to reduce our consumption, but every IPCC report is actually about that, that we need to reduce our energy appetite for, for, for some new energy, and then we'll probably will be able to cope with uh, uh, energy deficit, and probably the, uh, we can avoid of wars everywhere. Also, by, but like change uh, by some personal change, but in, but looking more beyond of that, that fossil fuel companies cannot be encouraged to make their peace washing 
to saving the world, so-called, and to justify the extension and intensification of the gas and oil exploration everywhere. So just for, for instance, uh, I do have data on total uh, ownership and assets and interest in Russia, which we are calling them to divest immediately to sell. So uh, they, they are almost 20, let's say five companies, um, just all, uh, not five, uh, four, uh, four companies, total ownership is about 20% of assets and 49 assets of uh, Thermokarstovoya uh, oil field as well, because four are like Novatec, very famous company, Yamal gas field, Arctic uh, uh, liquid gas field, and Karyaga oil fields, the others about 20%. So it, it's very much interconnected with what ECOP, uh, what, what's uh, to ECOP and to total activity on there, because uh, we, should, we should demand justice first of all, and all projects like, like this should be stopped and hold it immediately. So maybe um, because they enable, as we know, they enable the state regimes to accumulate the resources. It may further use for some conflicts, invasions, and finally, wars. Uh, their profit needs to be sized to fund the transition and to support peace building. Can we imagine some special tax on the profits of fossil fuel companies to make sure that this will never happen again? And uh, some, as we've just said, yes, there are a lot of questions arising from how we will live through the winter, where will we get some resources to heat our houses? But uh, this is a temporary, I would say this is a temporary question, temporary difficulties that we should not be afraid of. Uh, believe me, war is much, much worse. And uh, because you simply can lose your home and you can uh, lose everything, every infrastructure and everything. And I believe that the global community and local communities will be able to solve this problem. Even if we will, we, we just need to phase out fossil fuels, but the current reality just should just demonstrates that we need to do it the soonest. If we don't believe, if you don't want to believe IPCC reports that every year are warning us that's a code red for humanity. You should, you should stop doing immediately your exploration and extensive use. And you should, you should think of other ways how you can heat your houses, for example, and how you can transit to a clean and affordable and community-owned energy, which I also must highlight. And um, actually, I have a few resources and reports that prove that uh, exit from fossil fuels and just transition is possible. We do have enough of renewable energy in the world. But of course, we should double the in renewable energy potential in, uh, in, in the next few years. But this will only be possible when the long-time investments made in companies like, like Gazprom, Total, Chevron, Ex Exxon, and many, many others, many others, so will be divested and reverted to the green energy, green energy transition. Because in comparison with these carbon capture storage technologies, which are completely unproven and we cannot rely on them, the green and renewable energy is being proven to be the cheapest and the most affordable source of energy. We just need to escalate the funding of this particular perspective to create more equality and justice for our communities. Absolutely, thank you Svetlana. Um, we're slightly running out of time, unfortunately, um, to answer more questions. So maybe Mitzi, would you like to come in on that? question because I think it'd be really good to hear your perspective as well before we wrap things up. Only if you'd like to, of course, but. Sorry, my laptop fell um, at all <laughs> while I was listening. Um, no, exactly as what Vanessa and Svetlana already mentioned. I really just like to reiterate what Vanessa said about how the climate movement has to become more intersectional, how we have to recognize that, you know, especially the way media has been portraying this war, um, it is very racist and we're forgetting and we're not seeing how, you know, a lot of the messaging has been about how the refugees now are white 
and Christian and look like us. This is a quote from one of the media channels. Like this is actually something that people are saying. And so this is something that we have to call out. And this is something that we have to fight against that we can't just be anti-war when it's from in one region of the world. And it's always going to be so connected to the climate crisis because you know, war is going to release so many emissions. And who are the countries that are pushing for war? Who are the countries who will benefit the most from war? The countries who are the biggest arms dealers in the world, like the US. The countries who will profit the most from this war are also the countries who are historically responsible for the climate crisis. And they're all, again, as everyone's already mentioned, fighting over fossil fuels. And so it's really about making sure that we are united in our messaging that we are not for war in any form and we are not for fossil fuel industries. And we have to stand in solidarity with one another in every form, in every shape, in every way that we can. And not just this time, but every single time. We have to keep showing up for each other. We can't make excuses anymore that it's something that we don't understand or that it's too complicated. We've seen and we see continuously how everything is so interconnected. We have to show up for each other every single time. A fantastic way to end. Um, yeah, there was a lot that we went through there and um, yeah, a lot of things to think about. But for me, I think what I take most from that is that we have to make the decision to unite and have hope in each other and um, yeah, in the movement that we all put so much into it because we will be able to take down these systematic um, systems of injustice. Um, a few kind of, I guess, housekeeping style things um, and reminders um, before we yeah, end this webinar. Um, one was that this was recorded, so you can come like watch back and um, yeah, uh, hear again what all our incredible panelists had to say. And there's also another session of this same webinar um, later today, but with some different speakers. Um, so there was two to accommodate for different time zones. Um, so you know, if you're still awake at the time of the second webinar, definitely come along um, to hear some perspectives, um, the perspectives of some other panelists. And also on our climateimpact.org website, which maybe we can add into the chat, um, there will be ongoing webinars and kind of similar events taking place on that website. So make sure to check that out, um, yeah, to not miss anything. And then two reminders from a Fridays for Future perspective. Um, and yeah, two crucial dates to keep uh, in your mind and to perhaps write down. One is that um, following the call from FF Ukraine, um, we are mobilizing globally on Thursday, so tomorrow for most people's time zones, um, solidarity marches uh, in solidarity with, um, the, uh, with Ukraine and to show that we are against all forms of war and fossil fuel funded wars, especially. Um, so that is going to be taking place in yeah, many, many cities over the, across the world. So make sure to find your local um, march and yeah, uh, show your solidarity for the Ukraine. Um, and the other is that on Friday, March 25th, is our next global strike. So yeah, very, very exciting. Um, our kind of narrative around that is people not profit, which I think was very clear and came through in this webinar today. So make sure you're on the streets on March 25th. Um, it's gonna be really huge and we need all of you on the streets. So thank you so much. Um, thank you to all the panelists. It was absolutely wonderful to have you. Real privilege to hear your perspectives. And thank you for everyone who joined. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.